Well, let's start for the section. Um, okay, um, this is the last section of the day. Um, this is called capacity building in primary healthcare. Um, I, I, I guess uh, I want to explain why, why we have this kind of um, topic today. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Fong and I talk about this. Um, the reason that why we, we start with this topic is that um, during the COVID-19, um, a lot of um, healthcare organization uh, don't have enough, didn't have enough manpower. And at the same time, um, uh, we were contacted by uh, Hong Kong Jockey Club, and then they want to help. Uh, at the same time, uh, there were a lot of uh, youth who actually didn't get any job during COVID-19, and they were not uh, in any background related to healthcare. So we uh, came up with a solution. We call it Procuracy. Now, Joseph is also involved. Uh, uh, Dr. Fong is also involved. We actually train uh, a lot of um, young graduates during the COVID-19, and um, they had no background in healthcare. And then we put them into healthcare industry, a lot of healthcare practitioner and health coach as well. Um, and then um, even though um, this organization keep on telling us they don't have enough man manpower, First of all, they don't have the talent. The second, they don't have resources. So that's why we come up with this theme, capacity building in the industry. Um, and, and the most relevant speaker that we immediately think of is Professor Sally Chen, um, who is the, um, uh, the president of the um, Tongwa College. And Tongwa College is famous for training health practitioner in Hong Kong. I, I guess probably one of the largest um, in, in Hong Kong for nursing in Hong Kong. Um, so uh, may I introduce Professor Chen? Um, um, she's the third president of the Tunghua College, Hong Kong. Her career influenced the tripartite mission of research, education, and practice. She focused on translating evidence to improve healthcare practice outcome, supported by more than 100 funded studies, more than 400 propagation. Professor Chen has developed and sustained international internet interinstitutional partnership. She's on the list of the world's top 2% scientists, 2020, and top 2% most cited scientists in 2021 and 2022, released by the Stanford University. And without time, adieu, and then we give the time to Sally. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Fong, for your very kind introduction. A very good afternoon to you all. I'd like to thank Professor Fong and Dr. Ben Fong and the organizing committee for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, policy forum. And I'm so happy to uh, meet Professor Anna Horoy, uh, who uh, we, we were colleagues uh, at the Chinese University of Hong Kong more than 10 years ago, and we were colleagues for more than 10 years. So happy to meet all of you. And also <laughs> Professor Albert Lee. Yeah. <laughs> which you have not met for such a long period of time. So, uh, hello, everybody. And uh, OK, get into the topic of this presentation, capacity building. I need to uh, define the scope of the discussion. So it's not uh, just about increase uh, the potential of the individual, but also the organization and communities. And it's not just about the knowledge and skills, but also uh, the ability in planning, developing, implementing, and sustaining uh, health-related activities related to primary health care and according to the changing needs of the community. So from that sense, it's not a one-off intervention. It's a very long-term process. And before we talk about what do we need to improve, uh, we need resources. And of course, all of you here know that uh, in Hong Kong, uh, about 20% of our current health expenses uh, is for primary health care. But we think that 20%, uh, we know that uh, about 27% uh, is spent uh, on the uh, outpatient clinic, which is also uh, uh, related to uh, sort of treating diseases. And uh, so the point is whether we need the government to invest more or we need to consider how we, we allocate resources so that we can have uh, more funding to support uh, this very important uh, direction. And then we talk about human resources. We need human resources. And uh, it's not just about uh, recruiting more. And of course, we know that uh, in Hong Kong, we got less and less uh, prospective students from secondary school to join the training in the tertiary sector. So where can we recruit more? And uh, in Hong Kong at present, we are talking about importing healthcare professionals from various places. Uh, but of course, evidence uh, 
tell us that uh, it's not a, a long-term solution. The most important uh, solution is that uh, we expand the training capacity locally and uh, we have to retain our own uh, uh, healthcare professionals within Hong Kong. And when we talk about training, it's, it's not just the number, how, uh, how many uh, nurses, doctors that we trained, it's also about the content. What are the curriculum that they engaged in? Uh, I take uh, nursing training as an example. At present, nurses training syllabus is tightly controlled by the Nursing Council of Hong Kong. So of the 1,250 uh, 1, uh, hours of theoretical input, only 40 hours uh, are sort of devoted to health education and health promotion. And uh, for registered nurses training, uh, we have to have uh, 1,400 hours of clinical placement, and of which 60 hours is for primary health care. So you can see that uh, majority of the training, be it theory or uh, be it clinical placement, are very much focused on acute care. And if we really want to uh, move forward to uh, promote, uh, to prepare people uh, to be in primary health care, I believe uh, we need to we look at all this uh, curriculum and, uh, and the syllabus of training. And uh, the second thing I want to talk about in human resources is, yes, we, uh, when we talk about primary health care, it's not just related to family doctors, it's also related to uh, nurses, allied health, and other professional work in the community. And uh, I know that in many countries, we have nurse practitioners uh, work in the primary health care setting, and they play a very important role in taking care of people, especially in rural and remote areas. In Hong Kong, we have training in advanced practice nurse. We have APNs in Hong Kong, but whether APNs uh, can uh, really practice up to the full scope of uh, uh, the practice, uh, I'm, I, I really uh, have a doubt about this. Yeah, people are trained to do the job, but actually in the community setting, uh, in a primary healthcare setting, uh, we do not have nurses that can uh, practice solo yeah, like NPs in Australia, in UK, and in US, for example, family uh, nurse practitioner or uh, uh, practitioners uh, working in the community, taking care of patient, they can assess the patient, order uh, diagnostic tests, interpret diagnostic tests, and also prescribe uh, treatment, including medication. Yeah, so in Hong Kong, we, we still have not got uh, this category of nurses, and we are very far behind from other countries, including Singapore. And uh, so in terms of uh, human resources, apart from healthcare professional, of course, we also need uh, other uh, people such as administrator and technician. And the third resources that we really need to invest, uh, invest is uh, technology. Uh, we know that uh, in Hong Kong, we have uh, electronic uh, health record, but uh, how can we have data sharing between private and public sector, between uh, general practitioner and specialists, and also with other uh, healthcare institution? We still have not reached the point. So we have to invest in uh, this uh, technology. And apart from that, uh, because of the COVID, it accelerates the development or the incorporation of technology in taking care of our patients, for example, telemedicine, car consultation. And I believe uh, technology can really help us to expand the uh, scope of primary health care, especially uh, to provide outreach health education and health promotion. So what are the um, things that we can learn from other countries? I don't think uh, we, we can say that oh, Hong Kong is not good, other countries are much better than us, but I believe that, that uh, there must be some lessons that we can learn from other countries. Uh, in fact, uh, some of you may know that I left Hong Kong for more than 10 years, and I have worked in various places, including Australia, Singapore, and I studied in UK. So I, I, I sort of just want to share my uh, experience. It doesn't mean that they are better than us, but what I can see that is, uh, for example, in Australia, uh, they, uh, Australia is a big country and very dispersed population. So um, the focus is how uh, to improve access uh, to care in rural and remote areas and uh, how 
uh, it can attract uh, healthcare professionals to work in those areas. And in fact, uh, in those rural and remote areas, nurse practitioners play a very important role in uh, taking off the people and how we can leverage uh, the technology in uh, out, uh, providing care and uh, to people in remote area and interprofessional collaboration is very important and uh, you may know that in Australia primary care refers to the first contact point to health care in the community so it's not just general practitioner uh, but also include uh, community nurses, allied health uh, practice, community pharmacies, uh, mental health services, oral health, dental health, maternity and child health, etc., etc. So the scope is much broader, and interprofessional collaboration is very important. So it's uh, not a really very medical sort of model. And in Australia, they have primary health networks. So it's an uh, organization based in, in region. So what's the role of uh, the primary health networks. So they assess the uh, health needs of that region and then commission health services uh, for that region to meet the healthcare needs and also facilitate people to get in touch with the appropriate health uh, services so that uh, they can uh, obtain better health care as well as to avoid duplication of care. Then how about Singapore? And in Singapore, uh, it's a bit like Hong Kong, uh, Singapore also do not have uh, enough uh, healthcare professionals, so they uh, put a lot of effort in expanding the training capacity locally and also recruit uh, healthcare professionals from other countries. And uh, so they also put in efforts to uh, enhance the skills of existing practitioners in primary health care and improve the infrastructure and technology and so on. One thing you need about Singapore is the government put a lot of emphasis on how to track uh, indicators and uh, the achievement, uh, such as patient outcome, uh, population health indicators, health utilization data, so that they can use such data to uh, have the data-driven evidence-based decision making, and also make healthcare provider accountable uh, to what they are doing. And you, 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 in UK, I think you all know NHS. And at present, the, um, the capacity building effort focus on how to integrate health and social care services. And we know that when we talk about primary health care, it's not about just about health. It's about social, it's about environment, it's about housing, about education, about transportation. So there's a need to uh, have collaboration about uh, across sectors in order to promote holistic uh, primary health care. So uh, similar to uh, Australia and Singapore, it also invests in multidisciplinary team. So it's not just family doctor taking care of primary health care, it's also other professional working in the primary health care setting and uh, also improve technology infrastructure. And then uh, lastly is the Scandinavian country. There are a lot of countries within that region. Of course, different countries have different healthcare system and uh, policy. Uh, on the whole, uh, they also sort of uh, want to promote multidisciplinary team-based care. So it's very important that uh, all the healthcare discipline and other discipline work together to promote primary health care and then the continuity of care. And what I know is that in the future, they want to uh, focus on the management of chronic diseases, mental health, as well as data sharing. So the, that's what other countries have done. And then uh, how should we move forward? And uh, because I have to prepare for this presentation, I have some reflection yeah, of what, <laughs> what can be done, you know? We talk about primary health care uh, since the declaration of Amadata in uh, 1978, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, but when we look at the progress in Hong Kong, it's not that, yeah, yeah, great. that, that great, yeah? And I believe uh, all those involved have to have uh, the alignment of mission and vision. We are talking, we talk about primary health care here, uh, but how about the hospital authority? How about the social sector? How about the other sector? Do we have a common mission and vision so that uh, we can develop strategies and common goals and objective to move on? Yeah. And uh, so I've talked about it. It needs multi-stakeholder collaboration. 
so not just in health, but in social, transport, environment, education, etc. And uh, with NGOs, with private sector, with community-based organization. And uh, today I know that uh, uh, some of the participants here are from pharmaceutical companies. So I'm really sort of very happy that you, you all are here. And in fact, you are a very important part in the primary health care uh, development. So uh, I really hope that we can collaborate with you uh, in uh, discussing and planning how we should uh, move forward for primary health care uh, in Hong Kong. And government's role is so important. It's not just uh, putting money yeah, in primary health care, but to uh, be the leader and uh, to formulate policy, regulation, and guidelines to support the development and improvement. And also, uh, after putting in all the resources, the government also have a responsibility to monitor the quality and accessibility of it. I talk about NGO here, of course, it's not just NGO, but uh, uh, private sector and all the other uh, stakeholder. And I believe particularly in Hong Kong, the NGO has a very important role uh, because they uh, are sort of, uh, on the ground. They know the needs of uh, people, especially the needs of marginalized population, for example, new immigrant, ethnic minority group, uh, disabled uh, people with disability, so on. So they can play a very important role to uh, drive primary health care, especially now uh, the district health centers are run by NGOs. So they have a lot of room to promote com uh, community engagement and facilitate outreach uh, health education program. And lastly is the user. Uh, I believe uh, in previous section, many uh, speakers have mentioned about how about our consumers, how about our users, uh, where are the voices, have we consulted them, uh, have we asked the perspective, needs and experience in primary health care, have we asked them to evaluate uh, primary health care services, and I believe this is uh, a part that Hong Kong can do better uh, to involve our user uh, to get the sort of uh, involve them in the planning and development of primary health care services. So after we have done all that, uh, of course, like Singapore government, I learned a lot, you have to measure the outcome. Yeah, so what's the outcome of this capacity building? What are the indicators that you can use? Uh, in Singapore, I know that they use uh, different indicators to uh, evaluate the capacity, uh, capacity building strategies. For example, uh, the uh, immunization take up rate, uh, the quality of life indicator, mortality, etc. That is one type of uh, indicator. Uh, access and utilization are important. Uh, how easy people access to the surface, what is the utilization rate, and how are you going to measure that? And then the quality and continuity of care, whether uh, people follow clinical guidelines, uh, what about coordination of care, and what about patient reported outcome, and uh, what about the patient provider relationship and the care coordination. And then the cost effectiveness, yeah. and uh, we talk about cost effectiveness very often, uh, but it's not sort of a lot of uh, analysis have been done, especially in primary health care sort of setting. Uh, what is the cost and benefit of different approaches and how it can inform resource allocation decisions. And then uh, of course, it's very important. We have to uh, assess whether patient and the community really engage in the decision-making process and uh, whether after the engagement, they have changes in the knowledge, behavior, and empowerment. And of course, all these uh, indicators uh, is not just, uh, we can uh, obtain, collect data, uh, by quantitative method, but it's also very important that we collect data while qualitative approaches. So we can interview the person, we have focus group interview, we can have case study so that we can uh, obtain in-depth uh, insight into the experience, as well as have a better understanding of different complex factors that would affect uh, the, the outcome. And in fact, World Health Organization have proposed different tools and frameworks to measure the outcome of uh, the primary health care capacity building. 
Uh, for example, uh, if you look at the report that they have, uh, they propose the primary health care performance initiative, the World Health Organization primary health care quality framework, or the primary care assessment tool, uh, which involve facility assessment, health system assessment, provider assessment. All these uh, framework, in fact, follow the, um, the in input, service de delivery, outputs, and outcome model. And uh, this is an example of the uh, primary health care uh, performance initiative framework. So you can see uh, the system, the input, the service de delivery, output and outcome. And uh, in different uh, columns, they have different uh, indicators. And this is also another example of uh, what we call the uh, vital size profile template. So it's very easy to uh, interpret so for example, in the capacity uh, for the governance, you can uh, measure the, uh, the leadership, uh, the finance and the input, and then you have the performance and the impact. So this is also one, uh, one of the very good tools that uh, we can use to measure the outcome of the capacity building. Yeah, while I prepare this uh, presentation, uh, I remember that uh, in uh, when I was working in Australia, I noticed a very uh, good, uh, very short video clip to really uh, focus on what's the essence of primary health care. So I just want to show you two minutes. Primary health care is the front line of Australia's health care system. Each year, 81% of Australians visit a GP and 69% of Australians receive a prescription of medication. While most Australians will receive primary health care from their general practitioner or GP in the community, other health professionals also deliver primary care. This includes nurses, midwives, pharmacists, dentists, Aboriginal health workers and other allied health professionals. Primary health care focuses on keeping people well and out of hospital. The types of services delivered under primary health care are broad ranging and can include health promotion, prevention and screening, early intervention and treatment and management. Services may be targeted towards specific populations or health conditions such as asthma, diabetes, obesity, cancer, mental health and alcohol and other drug use. Primary health care services are delivered differently across metropolitan and rural areas due to variations in geography, community, economic factors, infrastructure and accessibility. Governments, organisations and health professionals have a role in ensuring health services meet the needs of communities. Primary health service planning must recognise the social determinants such as housing, education, employment, infrastructure and transport strongly impact the health of individuals and communities. Primary health care must build partnerships across sectors to address specific issues affecting the community. Partnerships might include with local hospitals, the social services sector or the education sector. A strong, accessible primary health care system supports people to manage their health in the community and ensures they receive the right care in the right place at the right time. So I think uh, I conclude my presentation by saying that, uh, yeah, when we talk about capacity building, it involves a lot of healthcare professional and different sectors. It has to be a cross sector. So it's a long term process. It's also a process of change of mindset. In the past, we focused a lot on acute care. Now we have to uh, change our direction and uh, it's a transformation. So we need to unlearn what we have learned before and we learned uh, the new things. And it is also uh, beyond improving the human resources capacity. In fact, it is uh, also a way to improve the organization and institutional context. And this is really my last slide. So I know that there are different peoples in this world, those who make things happen, those who think they make things happen, those who watch things happen, those who wonder what happened, those who didn't know anything had happened. And I believe all of you here uh, on a Saturday, uh, sort of late afternoon are those who make things happen. So thank you so much for your listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sally. Um, okay, today uh, we have a response from um, 
is Dr. Stephen Pang. Um, I, I know everybody knows Dr. Stephen Pang. Uh, he is the, what he's doing is the core subject that we discussed today. He is the Commissioner for Primary Health Care, uh, Hong Kong SAR government. He is the current President of the Hong Kong College of Community Medicine. Dr. Pang is an ex experienced health service executive and has been the head of human resources of the hospital authority where he provided strategic advice and leadership on the HR function of over 40 public hospitals. Let's give, give him a big hand. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Sally's Chan's presentation. Actually, um, I like her framework, which principally basically uh, points out the weakest link in Hong Kong uh, in the primary healthcare system. And uh, um, although we think we have a lot of the establishments in Hong Kong for the time being, but uh, if you look at the system from different countries' perspective, we are actually, uh, I can say, is quite left behind. Um, but uh, we all know that our health status in Hong Kong, uh, health status in Hong Kong is not, uh, it's really good actually compared with other countries in terms of life, expected lifespan. But um, the issue is the, um, uh, um, whether we are also good at the health lifespan. Okay, this is the some uh, uh, discussion uh, in the sometimes in other countries say the, um, you know, Singapore is much better than Hong Kong. I don't know. I try to take out the, uh, the intel but see whether it is the true case. But the issue is the um, uh, I think why we can keep a very good uh, health in terms of uh, uh, the parameters we measure probably due to our high caliber of talents and also professionalism that uh, we make our population healthy. But uh, if we totally rely on talent, um, I think this is the issue that we concern today, the whether it's sustainable uh, in longer term, because you can see that our talent now are very exhausted to tackle with the uh, aging population as well as the increasing chronic diseases. So if you look at the HA, um, for the time being, if you look at the uh, strategic plan, they are mainly focused on the facility planning to make our future hospital look better. They are recruiting, recruiting more people. In the last 10 years, the uh, number of uh, staff increased from 60,000 to now to almost 90,000 already. So I don't know how many more staff they can increase. So what we need to think outside the box is where the primary health care in the, and by mobilize the resources in the community as well as the private sector is the most important part that we need to focus on. So in the morning, uh, I think um, Dr. Li Bili has uh, points out that uh, the whole government really identified the issues and want to do more on health, uh, primary health care. But uh, primary health care is different from primary care. So primary care is a more uh, medical model that we can look at the Singapore model. I think most likely, they, more likely they are working on primary care. But uh, we are talking about primary health care that is not only the medical model, but also include the holistic and the social model in our future development. But the development of health, primary health care system is not that si simple and easy uh, because if you look at other countries, they have a long history of development from the, um, maybe, maybe they have their health account already, already used for many years. They have a accreditation system for the GP practices in Australia. They also have a very mature referral system, which if you look at the sum of the referral letters refer from GP today, you are so shocked that uh, you cannot read the referral letter at all. And uh, if, if you look at the organization or primary care organizations, uh, they may have the uh, system in place for many years. Now we start to build our primary health commission. So um, what I can say is different policy levels. If you still look at that, uh, it's, um, Dr. Uh, Professor Elberly in the morning said that if we still keep on the policy, as policy that is no one should deny from health care without means, and then the, our quality of care may just stay at the waiting time is longer and long, longer, right? Because we don't deny them, but uh, they need to wait. So what do we look at is future quality improvement. But uh, the first thing usually we look, we look at the funding model. So the question is the, what sort of funding model that would be helpful for primary health care development? Is it a high uh, subsidized model, like 95% of subsidies come from government or the, uh, all the people should have, should have some co-payment system or they need to contribute uh, no matter what they can contribute to, to uh, improve their own health. This is the related to funding model that we need to think about for the primary health care development. 
And then um, I know Professor Sally Chen is talking about the training. Yes, the training, um, uh, we have a very good universities in Hong Kong. We have a very good postgraduate training in Hong Kong. But if you really look in the primary healthcare uh, training, I think it's not that mature. Even I look at the nurses training, probably they start to have a more comprehensive training in the fellowship level. If you look at the um, uh, pharmacist training, uh, I think they, they don't have a very structural uh, primary care pharmacy training. If you look at the PT, physiotherapist training, I, I'm not sure whether there's any structural uh, PT training on primary care level. So what are we think the medical, uh, the medical side seems that they have a, a, a little bit more mature training in the family physician training. So that's, that's why I think the, it's also good to start with medical part because their structure and scope are quite well developed in the past uh, uh, decades. Now we, you know, our question is whether our professional should more focus on primary care training so that they can have a very structural uh, training to de deliver so that the people understand what the primary care and primary health care is. That would be critically important. Because um, whenever I talk with like some uh, other health uh, colleagues, they say, okay, I can make a diagnosis of something. Then that's the issue because we are talking about specialist care. If you talk, the, the, third, the third things we need to talk about is the, what you can make uh, to do to, to assess the risk of people instead of what's the diagnosis of that people because we are working on the first content of the people. So um, this is the concern. Then when, after training, then we need to talk about what's the uh, roles and duty when the primary care provider they should take up. For example, during the COVID, uh, we have a lot of VMO who visiting medical officer to OH home. But when outbreak, when the outbreak of uh, when the pandemic was announced um, uh, in in the community uh, by the WHO, we find there's no no many VMO are willing to go to OH home to give the vaccination. So what's the problem is that whether we need to have a, a role and responsibility that uh, one after, once after you take up the training and finish the training and be the primary care providers, what are the basic duties probably you need to consider? This is the question we need to think about. And then, and then after they have the duty and role assigned, how the team can we work together? That means uh, what's the scope of different practitioners or providers so they can accept how to work together. For example, um, if uh, a family physician, how can you work with your optometrist uh, in the community? How can you work with the pharmacies or can say clinical pharmacy work in the community? Whether you're willing to communicate with them when they encounter the uh, uh, the, the, the people outside, the, uh, you know, the, uh, inside the, uh, the business unit, uh, whether you can have some support or what's the communication channel you can, you're willing to build. So that sort of things we are still have no platform to do it. Although e-health will be our future platform, but at least the professionals, what's our their willingness to do that? Even with their team building, what's the empowerment that the government can provide to the, to, to the providers, that can be uh, uh, what is it due to the, is it uh, you know, we can have uh, empowerment through the subsidized programs or empower them through the service agreement or we can empower them through the guidance, guideline, reference framework. So that sort of things uh, will be the uh, questions we need to encounter. So um, with all those things in mind, the last thing is that how can we change the mindset of the community to take up preventive care as their key yeah, the, 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 the key things to, to maintain the health instead of uh, when they are sick, they, they are go to see doctors. So these are the, the, the most, most important parts that we need to achieve. So um, this is what some um, things I bring up for discussions. I think um, the issue is the, I like the last um, slide of uh, Professor Sally Chen is the, what's the process of change? I think this is what's the perception of perceived change that need, the, the perceived, uh, uh, no, not sorry, but see, what's the acceptable change that uh, the, the community were willing to take? What's the system change in the short term we can take up? What's the internal process? Like the, what's the, uh, what's the uh, first things we need to build to so they change the people's mindset from the system, uh, from prevention, from treatment based to preventive focus. And, uh, and the last thing is the, what's the alignment within the professional so that we can work together. So those are the um, uh, main questions in my mind. I hope to have a more discussion on this part. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Peng. Um, 
Uh, today we have um, uh, as other sections we have um, three uh, discussions. Um, first of all, we have uh, Mr. Jimmy Wong. Um, Mr. Jimmy Wong became a nurse specialist in elderly care after receiving training in the UK in 1990. He obtained a master's degree in healthcare management in two, two, year 2000. His main fields were services development and nurse training in private and community healthcare. Mr. Wong is the founding president of the Hong Kong Association of Family Medicine and Primary Healthcare Nurses and president of the Hong Kong College of Communi Community and Public Health Nurses, 2018-2022. Give you the time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fung's kind introduction, and thank you, Dr. Ben Fong, to invite me to be here. Actually, I learned a lot from the seminar, both the section two and section three here. Um, for me, as I introduced by uh, Professor Fong, that uh, I'm a nurse in background, so my focus may be on more science on nurse training, something like that. But as I, you know, I've been working in the X-ray field for more than 40 years, so my, what I see the primary care is uh, from a different angles. Say, so I agree with Professor Chen that there are four major elements uh, which will affect the development of primary health care, which the uh, hardware, software, government support, that means the, the money and the potential kind. For the hardware, I think if all of us have visited the DHC center, we found they are very beautiful, well designed, uh, paced, so, and the IT system is well updated. So the hardware is already ready. And the software is as um, introduced by Professor Chen that um, most of the uh, other health staff, doctors and nurses are well trained in Hong Kong, but what I say but is that I think we all agree that our healthcare professionals are trained, well trained in the university level and gain the experience in hospital and clinic base. So what, in, uh, I mean the, at all time, they are uh, posted by Kai in Chinese Kao Yi. That means the patient or the client need to ask, seek help, uh, seek advice from the healthcare professional rather than the healthcare professional go down, put down themselves and go down to sort the, to connect the patient. This is different. That's why primary care is different from traditional medical care. So I want to bring out this because I want to talk later about the why we have, why I have this concept. And the software is okay, uh, and because they all are well trained uh, and the government support is very important. That's why we can see Dr. Pan since her, his impose last year. I can see, I can saw him every time in the any conference in primary health care. <laughs> that means because of him, I think money is not a major problem nowadays for primary health care. And the fourth element is the kind, so the stakeholder. According to the statistics from the healthcare bureau, that there are thousands and thousands of their target. So target kind is not a problem then. So what I want to raise out this time is that the, how to link up, my concern is how to link up these four elements to our kind, especially kind and our professional staff. How to link up them. As everything, the four elements are ready, even are ready. But how to link up is a problem. Nowadays, I'm not sure every people in Hong Kong understand DHC. Even that we have a publicity for, for nearly one year. But at least in my district, a district in, in New Territory, most I meet most of the our citizens, they are they knew very aware of them understand the DHC service in their district. And they also raise many problems, many questions about that. That means to me is there still a communication gap in between the kind and the, the government. So back to the here, back to here. My, uh, my point is that we want, if we want to push the primary care effectively, most important thing is our staff altitude towards the primary health care system. 
Did they buy the system? Did they pay hard to put up themselves and come to engage, as Professor Chen said, engage them in the problem, in, in, the, in the program? It's very important to build up a very, very good relationship with them. So as, as I always said to my students that whenever you have a good care and a good uh, primary care uh, uh, leader, then once the patient feel something wrong, the first one he think he or she think about is to find you, to seek help from you, no matter what kind of illness, then you are success. We want to pay our, I expect that our primary care not, may, may not be a nurse, but the, the healthcare professor be the one who need the, the, as a case manager, something like the family doctor, family um, uh, the carer, something like that. So we we need to pay attention. I agree with Dr. Pence that our training are enough for them to make this, yes. We need more training, but at least as we start already, we start already. So, so the, for the time being, we need to empower them. Empower them. Some of them already share their expertise in the social, in the daily service for, for a long time. But the empowerment is important because they are something. Some I hear say something that they they want to do something. So important works, but they are restricted by some guideline, protocol, and they dare not to create some new idea, something like that. So I always, um, when I have the chance to meet the, the chief coordinator of the, the DXUC Centre, I always encourage them to bring up the problem, or maybe you can refer to Dr. Pan, Dr. Lam, or whatever. We can, we can share their good views, because they have real, really practical problems they encounter, and then that's, why the bottleneck was there. So if you can't solve the problem there, then every time we have the bottleneck and there, they don't need to, they are there not to, come, to raise any important level. So I agree with her, Dr. Ben that training is the second step for a time period. Encourage them, encourage them, empower them for those who are already working in the daily time and care service. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, then we we'll have the second uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Cameron Chen. Cameron Chen obtained his PhD in Chinese medicine from CUHK in 2007, and he has more than 20 years of working experience uh, pertinent to research on Chinese medicines and teaching. Currently, he is a lecturer with the Hong Kong Institute of Integrated Medicine, CUHK. He has also taken up the role of a convener. Um, responsible for coordinating and liaising with stakeholders and working partners to fund and conduct scientific research. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Fong. I would like to talk about the role of Chinese medicine in capacity building in primary, primary health care in Hong Kong. First, Chinese medicine provides an alternative of treatment option for primary health care in Hong Kong by integrating Chinese medicine into primary care setting, patients have access to a wider array of treatment ways, including acupuncture, herbal medicine, bone setting, and massage. <clears throat> this diversification allows for personalized and patient-centered care to individual preferences and needs. Second, Chinese medicine emphasize a holistic approach to healthcare, focusing on the balance and harmony of the body, mind, spirit, spirit. By incorporating Chinese medicine into primary healthcare, Chinese medicine practitioner can address not only the physical symptom, but also the underlying imbalance of root cause of health issue. The comprehensive approach contribute to more holistic and patient care center primary health care system. Third, Chinese medicine plays great emphasis on preventive measure and health promotion. 
Chinese medicine practitioner often provide advice on lifestyle modification, dietary recommendation, and mind management techniques to enhance overall the well-being and prevent the onset of disease. By integrating Chinese medicine into the healthcare system, these prevent measures can be incorporated into routine care promoting a proactive approach to health and wellness. Next, the integration of Chinese medicine into the healthcare in Hong Kong encourage collaboration and knowledge sharing between Western medicine practitioner and Chinese medicine practitioner. This operation allows for the exchange of expertise, research findings, and best practice leading to a more comprehensive and evidence-based approach to patient care. Last, the integration of Chinese medicine into healthcare in Hong Kong has needs to increase research and evidence-based trial in the fields. Research studies are conducted to evaluate the efficacy, safety, and mechanism of action of Chinese medicine treatment. This contribute to the body of knowledge and have informed clinical decision making, ensure that Chinese medicine is practiced based on scientific evidence and best practice. Over the role of Chinese medicine in capacity building in primary healthcare in Hong Kong, lie in its ability to provide diverse treatment options, promote a holistic approach to healthcare focus on prevention and health promotion, foster collaboration and knowledge sharing, and contribute to research and evidence-based practice. Thank you. When uh, it comes to Dr. Joseph Lern, uh, Dr. Joseph Lern has been actively engaging in information technology industry and higher education. He's currently the Vice President of the Hong Kong Internet Forum, Vice Chair of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, panel member of the Asian Domain Name Dispute Resolution Center. He's also the Honorary Research Associate of our Hong Kong Institute of Asia Pacific Studies. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Anthony, introduction. Um, I think I might be the only one that uh, have a stronger technology background. So. To, uh, this afternoon, I would like to share from maybe more on technology pers perspective. Um, actually, I think within this last three years pandemic period, I think there are two areas that definitely uh, become very important. One is health, another is technology. And I think these two areas will not be reversible. And in Hong Kong, I think uh, pandemic has uplifted the penetration of mobile apps because of the live home safe on some children. But however, he also widened the gap of digital divide. Um, so also, we need to think about, if talk about primary health care, we might need to think about how to pursue um, digital health because technology def definitely play an important role, just like uh, Professor Sally Chen has mentioned in her PowerPoint. And also come with another issue is talk about digital literacy. Because if we cannot uh, maintain a good digital literacy, like elders, like all those, I mean, our, our citizens, so it's very difficult to pursue, to push digital health. Um, but if we want to push it, so which party should be responsible? Should government play a role? Of course, I think government should take the lead. But if so, which borough should take the lead as well. Because if we recall about some digital government policy uh, in the past, we might heard about Digital 21 policy and also smart city blueprints. But however, all this have not touched with any things about digital health. Another issue I would like to <clears throat> bring out is about data collection. Because data collection is also very important. Without data, we can't do any data analytics. We can't know about, what, I mean, how to do any pre prevention policies. If I pick Singapore as an example, in 2020, 
the Singapore government has uh, partnered with Apple Watch, has launched a Lumi Health app. Actually, it's a trial for two years uh, on a voluntary basis to encourage the citizen. Uh, if they join the plan, then they need to submit the health status through the through the smartwatch. But I don't know uh, at the end how how much it will be the penetration rate and how's the result. Um, but this is might be a good way for us to consider as a pilot, because nowadays I think many of us got a smartwatch. I think it's not really that expensive, even for elders. I think if we can make use of this type of device to collect what's happening about the health status, then we, we can try, I think for government, we can try to think about some prevention policies. But of course, in the same time, we need to think about is the privacy control, uh, because go back to the last session, we talk about matter of trust a social trust, a trust on government, and so on. So I think this might be something that we can think about it because definitely I think Hong Kong is, uh, is very, uh, I should say is, is very uh, good to become a smart city. We have the very good infrastructure. Uh, we have the hardware software. I think if our government can try to think about, spend some resources on digital health on this side and think about how to collect the data as, as, as a start, then I think we can, we can think about how to help to maintain a sustainable healthcare system. Uh, that's what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you.